So yesterday, um, Wildman Mallon talked to you guys about the new anticoagulants, right? How much did he talk about PCCs yesterday? Did you get into a lot of detail? I got no's and yeses, so there was not a lot. Okay, perfect, because this is actually more pertinent for the PCCs. The reality is, with the new anticoagulants, we're all basically just screwed. If somebody comes in bleeding, we're in trouble. Um, until they get things like factor 10A concentrate, we're going to be in trouble with those. So this is a little more clear cut. Um, and the reason that we added this to the lectures this year is because the ACCP, which is the American College of Chess Physicians, publishes uh, basically anticoagulation guidelines. And if you Google it, if you actually go to it or you do a literature search on it, the, the document that gets produced on anticoagulation is enormous, absolutely enormous. Within it, buried within it, but the reference is actually in there for you, is the recommendations by this rather austere and I think pretty uh, literature-based group that looks at what to do if you have somebody who has an elevated INR on warfarin, what to do. And so we'll talk about sort of the nuances of this, but it's in there. And, and the, to be completely frank, the guts of it is right there in that table on the first page of your, of your art, um, chapter in this thing. Because one of the things we need to know about, we know we've, warfarin has been around for a really, really long time. We've, we, and we all know the issues with warfarin. Warfarin differs from the new anticoagulants that Billy talked about yesterday because that what warfarin does for you is instead of going directly to a factor and blocking it, okay, in, interrupting its efficacy. So you have all the factors in your system and as many as you need, it's just that you can't use them because they're blocked. That's what the new anticoagulants do. The tar the, and to be honest, they should be called targeted anticoagulants because they're targeting a specific um, coagulation factor. Warfarin is different, and we know this. Warfarin basically blocks production in a very broad fashion by blocking vitamin K. It's a VKA, a vitamin K antagonist, meaning that it blocks factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. It also blocks anti, you know, antithrombin 3, protein S, and protein C. So it kind of has this broad brush, decreased production of factors that both help you clot and factors that are anticoagulant, which is one of the reasons that that bridging becomes an issue. You may be one of those people where if you're given warfarin, the first thing you block is your protein S, protein C instead of your factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And for a short amount of time, you're more likely to, you're procoagulant, at least in theory. It's one of the reasons that we bridge. So bridging becomes an issue when you use warfarin. And the fact that it is blocking vitamin K means that you know, you're, if you absorb it differently, that you end up with a lot of potential problems with vitamin K. So say you decide to go on a kale diet, since that seems to be the cool thing these days, is like have kale, nasty, oh my goodness. Grind it up in your blender if you want it and stick in some pineapple, that makes it palatable, but kale is the thing. Kale is loaded with vitamin K. So somebody decides to get healthy and they're taking, taking warfarin, they're in deep trouble. <sighs> Suddenly they are just not anticoagulated at all, or they get stuck on septra, okay, Bactrim. They get a UTI, they get put on Bactrim. Well, now all of a sudden their INR is 11 because they've, they've changed how they absorb vitamin K, they've changed their gut flora. It's remarkable what little can, can change your anticoagulation status with vitamin K, or with uh, warfarin, and we know this. We, all, we know this, we deal with it all the time. I'll, there's an abstract in here that looks at how variable it is for people that come in the ER, we'll get into it in a minute. So we know the issues that come up with warfarin. That being said, despite all the marketing and the big push for the new anticoagulants, which I think are going to become quite dominant in the market, there's still a whole lot of people who are on warfarin. And even with the new drugs on the market, there will still be a lot of people who need to be on warfarin because particularly people with renal disease can't be put on those new drugs. Okay, they just, and if they have renal failure, they absolutely cannot be put on those new drugs. So we'll still be seeing a lot of people on warfarin. So if that's the case, our issues that come up with those patients in our setting are twofold. One big category is what do you do with that person with an INR of 12, but they're totally fine. They're not bleeding, they're asymptomatic, but their INR is 12. Flip that around, what do you do with somebody who's on warfarin with an INR of 1.8, but they have a head bleed? What do you do with those? And that's what we're going to address. We're going to ask those two questions. Now, this, this table comes out of that ACCP guideline I mentioned, which came out in October of 2012. If you look at the table, what the, what the questions that you need to ask when someone comes in who's on warfarin, so you know, they're on, that's their Coumadin is on their drug list, is first of all, are they bleeding at all? Okay. If they're bleeding, how bad is it? So bleeding, yes or no, life-threatening or not, basically, serious bleeding or not. So that's one thing. You need to know their INR. That's point number two. Now, this table implies that that's all you need to know. You just need to know their level of their INR and whether they're bleeding and how badly. 
But we know in the emergency setting that we have a couple other little nuances of this that are not addressed well in the guideline that I will, I'll be, you know, we can talk together about how we do this. But what do you do with the um, why are they on it question? You know you approach a 18-year-old you know, who had a cast on who has a clot in his leg very differently than somebody who has a mitral and aortic valve replacement as far as their anticoagulation status. And by the way, valve replacement is also not an approved reason to be using the new stuff. So warfarin will still be in people that have the valves in. So we'll still be seeing it in that group as well. So that's question number one. Why are they on it? That like, adds an additional question that we need to kind of think about. The other thing that is, is what's their home situation? You know, is it a tottery, you know, frail older person who lives alone where that INR of 12 going home may not be a great idea versus somebody who has a great family around? So we have a little more nuanced issues that come up with this than just this table that sort of implies a simple algorithmic approach. That being said, though, this table is a very, very good guideline, and it's based pretty well in literature. A couple of things to know about it compared to the previous iteration, which was in 2008. They've done two significant things to that recommendation. One is they've changed the INR ranges. So if you look at the ranges, they actually take the lower, it used to be five, the lower end cutoff to worry was five, now they've dropped it to four and a half. And they've taken the upper end of the range where you actually change your practice in the non-bleeding patient to 10. And that's based on the fact that the bleeding risks are different in those, in those ranges. The other thing they've done that's different in this thing is there's no IV vitamin K recommended unless you have serious bleeding. Now we'll get into why in a minute. But that is a distinct change from the last time. And if you have trouble remembering these kinds of guidelines and all this stuff, there's a, a free, I, I, my disclaimer is it comes from our institution, but we make no money off this thing. Um, there's a free app called Wickham, W-I-K-E-M. Okay, not Wiki -E -M, but Wickham, W-I-K-E-M. You can get it in the App Store, you can get it in the Droid Store, the Google Store, but you can download it and it basically is a, is a searchable, you know, just tap in Warfarin, it'll pop up all the different options with Warfarin, including that table. So it's a free app, I recommend it, I use it all the time and we update it on an ongoing basis. And if you ever find anything in there you think you need or it's not updated, let us know, we'll fix it. So that's in there. So if you, the, all this stuff is impossible to remember. So it's out there if you want to have that quickly. All right. If we need to reverse warfarin, what are our options? How do we go about this? Well, there are two things you're doing with warfarin reversal. One is to restore. I'm restoring my ability to make those factors I've blocked. That's vitamin K. Okay. And it's also taking away the warfarin itself. So holding the drug and giving something like vitamin K to restore my ability to produce it. The other is to replace. Until I can make my own, I need to give that person back some factors so that they stop bleeding. So it's basically a restore and replace issue. So if we kind of focus on that, there's another table in there that I pulled from an article that actually looks at what we can do and how quickly it works. A table that sort of has, starts with oral vitamin K, goes down to recombinant 7A. And there's a column in there I want you to kind of look at quickly. And we'll get into the details. But it says time to effect after administration. Vitamin K we know takes a little time. This looks at oral vitamin K, it takes 24 hours to reverse. IV vitamin K takes 12 hours to reverse. We'll get into a little more detail in a minute. But there's one thing in there as well that says fresh frozen plasma reverses immediately. Now fresh frozen plasma has a lot of factors in it, including 2, 7, 9, and 10. So what I can do theoretically is give you fresh frozen plasma and those factors are now in you and it reverses you immediately. I'm gonna make an argument to, the, to you that it doesn't, okay, when we get into this in a minute. So those are, that table sort of tells you what your options are. Let's get into the details. Vitamin K, back in the day, those of us who've been practicing for a long time used to give it sub-Q. Okay, vitamin K sub-Q is a routine dosing regimen. It turns out it's very erratically absorbed. Its efficacy is completely unpredictable. So sub-Q has been taken off the table as a mode of administration. So you're left with oral and IV. The abstracts that are in here that look at this basically say that the oral onset to really reversing you to a level where your bleeding risk drops is about 12 hours, or oral is about 24 hours, IV is about 12. Notice that neither of those is, I'm bleeding to death right now, I'm gonna fix it right now. So they, both of those take time. The reason they've taken IV only to the serious bleeding as far as the recommendation is, the overshoot rate when you give it IV is significant. Basically, you anticoagulate them and keep them anticoagulated way too long, or the IV rate is much, much more common to overshoot. And that's where we get into the why are they on it. Somebody with a valve? I don't want to overshoot them at all. 
Okay, I'd like to not actually, I'd like them to stop bleeding. And if I do it, if I need it for a short amount of time because I need to get them reversed again. So it turns out that it's really hard to regulate somebody when you give them vitamin K, period. And the overshoot rate is higher with the IV dosing. So the IV dosing really has been relegated only to they're really bleeding badly. It's a life-threatening kind of problem. I really got to take the risk of overshooting and keeping them you know, reversed too long, but it's worth it. So vitamin K is sort of, remember, all it's doing is giving you a chance to, re to remake, restore your ability to make them, but it's not giving you anything magic to reverse you right now. So that, that's sort of the recommendation of vitamin K. How about FFP? So I need those factors. FFP has basically all of those factors. How great is that? Well, the things you know about FFP, there's certain things about FFP that are important to understand. First of all, how many of you treat hemophiliacs? We have quite a few actually come to our place. Hemophiliacs will come to you and they will say, I have less than 1% factor activity, I have 3% factor activity, or I have 5% or greater factor activity. That, that's important because less than 1% factor activity, they are the people that spontaneously bleed. 5% or greater factor activity, they're less likely to have a problem. And to be normal, to be hemostatic, so I cut my arm, I need to clot that. To be normal, I have to have 15 to 25% factor activity. Some, some are as high as 35, but basically let's just deal with 25% factor activity. That means that if I have no factor activity at all and I'm bleeding, I'm going to have to get enough into my system to get me up to 25%. So that's kind of point number one. Point number two is for every unit of FFP, you get 3 to 5% activity of any given factor. So if you do the math, I, I need to get up to 25%. Let's say I have 5% per unit. I need five units of FFP. The third piece of information that's important is that it's about 225 cc's per unit of FFP. So now I'm to at least a liter and a quarter, maybe even as much as two liters of FFP to get me hemostatic, okay, to get me enough factor that I'm sure I'm going to stop bleeding. So, so that brings up a couple of the issues that come up with FFP. One is it's a big volume load. To really get somebody enough factor activity to quit bleeding, it is a big volume load. And think about the people who are on Coumadin. Heart disease, congestive heart failure issues, you run the risk of putting them into pulmonary edema with the amount of FFP you need to really reverse them. So that's sort of factor number one. Factor number two is it's fresh frozen plasma. So it has to be thawed for you to use it. So this idea of immediate isn't really immediate. You have to do the thawing to get the thing even in there. And then it takes a while to infuse, even if you blast it in there, which you shouldn't, it takes a while to infuse. So this idea that you can immediately reverse somebody with FFP, which has been our go-to thing forever and a day, is actually a fallacy. And abstract, the abstract by Lee, which is abstract number five, um, within, buried within that paper, which is a paper that looks at uh, how much an intracranial hematoma bleed increases when somebody's on warfarin. Buried in there is how long it takes to actually reverse someone, for real, in real life, with FFP. From the, to from the time of presentation, it took three hours to get it started, as far as administration. It took nine hours to complete it, and actually took as long as 30 hours to get the INR down to normal. So, so is that again? And tons of volume, right? You're up to two liters with this. So, so overall, FFP it has a lot of challenges. And if, it's all we had for a long time. So it was the best we could do. But know that it is no longer the go-to agent. The reason the recommendations have changed to PCCs is that PCCs offer a whole lot of benefit that you can't get from the FFP. So let's talk about PCCs. How many of you guys know for sure that you have prothrombin complex concentrates available to you in your emergency department? If you don't, I task you with going back and finding out the first thing when you get there. Because this is truly, all you have to do is use it once in somebody who's, over, who's anticoagulated on warfarin, who's having a bad bleed, and you will be sold. It is like magic. Um, the other thing is those of you who do know, and what, those of you who are going to go back and find out, find out what kind you have. Okay, they, it comes in sort of two flavors, three-factor and four-factor. And let me, get it, let me explain. What PCCs are, the reason that PCCs even exist, is they were developed initially for hemophiliacs. They wanted a, a concentrate 
of a specific factor that was activated, so the minute it got in the patient's body, it would stop them from bleeding. So it was originally designed for hemophiliacs. Subsequently, what they discovered, and what they are, is they take human plasma, pooled, they basically dry it up, turn it into a powder that you can then reconstitute, get rid of all the viruses, inactivate all the viruses, make it into a little, it comes out a little vial this big. Remember FFP, all those big cold bags of icky stuff that con condense and make a big mess. This is a little vial of something. And the flavors it comes in are basically three factor or four factor. It's two, seven, nine, and 10 that are in there. Some of them just have two, nine, and 10. Some of them have two, seven, nine, and 10. And we'll get into that difference because it's really important. They also have a little bit of antithrombin 3, a little bit of protein S, a little bit of protein C. It's kind of all the stuff that you would get if you were, that you need back if you're taking something like warfarin. A couple things to know about these factors. So the virus, they're virus inactivated. They don't need to be ABO compatible at all, like FFP does. They, um, they, the total volume of these things is about 150 cc's. And you will reverse people as soon as it's in their system. The reversal happens at about 15 minutes. That is enormous. I have somebody with a bad head bleed, they're on warfarin, they're you know, going down the tubes, this is magic. I have somebody with a massive variceal bleed, this is magic as far as reversing them. Really important to know how to use these things. Now they are blood products, and so one of the issues that comes up um, is whether these are contraindicated in people who can't take blood products for religious reasons. I went actually to the Watchtower, which is the Jehovah's Witness sort of Bible equivalent, to see what their position is on these. And I will tell you, they don't take a position. So one of the things you may encounter is if a Jehovah's Witness says, I don't, I can't. The reality is that they, they may be able to. It's just a matter of sort of their personal preference. And you, a lot of it depends on how you sort of sell this. But know that these, these things are absolutely life-saving. Now, there are contraindications to them. They, are, um, they have a little bit of heparin put in there when you reconstitute them, there's some heparin in there. So if somebody has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, can't use it. Hasn't been tested in pregnancy, so we don't know, but I'll tell you, if there's a life-threatening bleed in somebody on warfarin, I'm giving it to them. Okay, they shouldn't be on warfarin anyway when they're pregnant, but that's, so know that that's an issue. Um, and it has, hasn't been tested in children. The other thing to know about this as well is that it does increase your clotting risk. So there's some papers in here that look at this, and it does increase your risk of doing, getting something like an MI or having a stroke. That's important because this brings back the nuances. So if you look at the table in the beginning, it says serious bleeding with any elevated, it should say elevated INR, it says any INR, any elevation in INR, there's said any. Well, now think about that. If I have somebody with a GI bleed, but I've got them sort of metastable, and I have GI coming in to take a peek, they're not exsanguinating at the moment, that's a serious bleed, but they're kind of stable at the moment, and they have a valve, that's why they're on it. I may not reverse that person. I may get GI in there, I, we're gonna withhold their warfarin, maybe give them, give them their vitamin K that's recommended, and then just see how they do over time. Versus somebody who, I, they're herniating because they're bleeding into their head. I'm gonna reverse that right now. Okay, so it really, you're gonna have to nuance this as far as giving this uh, the um, sort of reason, because this does definitely cause increased risk of, of clotting. And these are monstrously expensive. Anywhere between $2,500 and $5,000 to dose it. <coughs> The other thing to know is the dosing that you give, this thing lasts shorter than the duration of warfarin. So warfarin's duration is 12 to 24 hours, it's half-life. It takes five half-lives to go away completely. So within anywhere between three and five days, the warfarin is completely gone. The problem is that this lasts between four and six hours. So at the four hour point, I'm gonna to need to recheck an INR. And if their INR has gone back up again and they're still having bleeding risk, I may have to redose this thing. So prothrombin complex concentrates are really, really awesome as far as what they do, but there's more nuance to it than what is implied from the ACCP. And so you're going to have to make some kind of nuanced decisions at the bedside. Does it work as far as saving outcomes? Does it, does it work? What is interesting, and one of the things that's being challenged right now a little bit, is this idea of just using it willy-nilly. Does it actually make a difference? The group that's the biggest concern is the brain bleed group. That's the biggest concern group. Because most of the other stuff we can do something, go to the operating room, stop bleeding, do a scope and stop bleeding, but brains are tough, brains are difficult. They're the papers that have looked at this say that if you use PCCs in somebody who is on warfarin with an elevated INR and they have a hematoma that's measurable, that the hematoma growth, the actual growth of that bleed is less if you get a PCC, which makes sense. It so far hasn't translated very well though into patient-oriented outcomes. Doesn't change a lot the neurologic outcome 
or even the mortality of these folks. Because honestly, a brain bleed is a terrible thing. It's just a terrible thing to have. So there's going to be some data out there, there's some studies that are going to be looking at, does it really make a difference in outcomes? I think, I think the bottom line is it's still going to cut to saying, give it, because what the heck else are you going to do? These people are so sick, uh, that, and the mortality rate is so high, it's probably worth doing anyway. But just know there's some a little bit of rumbling out there that this expens expensive treatment may not change patient-oriented outcomes. Um, oh, by the way, there's one really, really good paper. If you want to pull one paper that covers all the jazz that Billy talked about yesterday and the warfarin stuff, it's number 10. So if you have somebody who can pull a paper for you, have you have access to the web, that Frumkin paper is a lovely summary of what to do about uh, the overanticoagulation issues. So that's issue number one, the bleeding person, the ways to reverse it. Issue number two is what do we do with that just elevated INR and somebody who has no bleeding whatsoever? They come in, they've got an ankle sprain, Somebody out in triage got an INR, and the INR is nine. Now, what do I do with that? Um, a couple things to know. One of our worries is spontaneous bleeding risk. The spontaneous bleeding risk goes up at an INR of 10, and it goes up particularly in elderly patients, patients that are, who are diabetic, and maybe some people, other people with renal disease, you know, dialysis dependent kind of folks. That's the group where your, the hairs on your neck are going to go up a little bit, even if they're not bleeding. If their INR is over 10, they're 85 years old, and they're diabetic, the hairs on my neck are going to go up a little bit. Because you're, one of your decisions you have to make is can you send that person home? What to treat it with is in the table, and that is actually right spot on. Hold the doses, maybe give a little bit of, of oral um, vitamin K, you know, check them again in a day or two. The issue for us is, do I keep that person in the hospital or do I send them home? Most people can go home. As long as they're not a fall risk, most people go home, they're just fine. I mean, you don't have to keep them around. But have a lower threshold to perhaps OBS, the person who is diabetic, elderly, with a super high INR. That may be something that fits very well into an OBS category. Begs the issue entirely where they get paid for the OBS for those particular people, but just know that that's, that's the group that's the big, and fall risk is a huge one, absolutely huge one. Um, oh, the, the abstract number 12 is the one I referred to earlier that talks about should you be even checking INRs in somebody, so if, they have, if the person has an ankle sprain, was the person who ordered the test at triage wrong to order an INR? Should we be ordering them all the time in everybody who shows up in the ER who's on Coumadin? This is a paper by David Newman. David Newman is the number needed to treat blog guy. Really brilliant, he's one of the faculty for this course. And he did a paper that just basically looked at how often does something need to change in somebody's warfarin recommendations, dosing or diet or whatever, based on just a random checking of an INR. And it turns out it's pretty significant. One in eight patients where the INR was checked needed to have something done, a dose adjusted up, a dose adjusted down, something done to help fiddle with their dosing. I'll let, leave it up to you to decide whether you make it a routine practice or not. I, I think it totally is up to you. But just know that if you do check them, you're going to run into cases pretty significantly, one in eight. We're going to need to do something about fiddling with the dose of that person. And it tells you how awful warfarin is, to be honest. It's really tough, really tough. So. That's the general gist on this. I think the main thing for you to know is to check that table and know that that table exists. And the, the last two papers in here say we don't do that. The last two papers in here are a lawyer's dream. Next door is a conference of lawyers. I kid you not. Just walk down the hall, right over there is a little conference of lawyers. Fortunately, they're not talking about how to sue us. They're worried about their bar exam. But, the, <laughs> but know that this, these two papers are an attorney's dream. They say that, we, that the guidelines are out there, a lot of us don't even know they exist, which you have no excuse for, okay? You just don't anymore. And a lot of people who knew they existed didn't follow them because they didn't believe in them. Because this is such a high risk problem, warfarin is one of the biggest, it's the most lethal side effect drug we prescribe. We'll see what happens with all these new ones, but right now it's the most lethal side effects. So you've got to be really careful with a drug that is that potentially lethal. Um, and so it's just, just know about these guidelines. I know that they, they sort of follow them. They're quite well designed. Yeah? Is there anything out there on patients who were not involved in uh, liver failure, particularly INR three or four, and they have bleed? So, so the problem with the people in liver failure is the difference between them and somebody who's on, as far as the, the bleeding risk itself or what to do about it? What to do about it. So the difference in those people compared to this is that the restoring concept, the give them vitamin K and they'll make more, it does that part doesn't work because the liver doesn't work. They're not making their own on their own. 
So you can certainly consider giving vitamin K, but, but don't expect a thing out of it from those folks. And that's where the replacement becomes a significant concern. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you can get PCCs. It's less volume load. And a lot of people who have liver disease, volume load is an issue. So it's significantly less volume. It gives you what you want. It gives you exactly what you want. What does it cost for a dose? Between $2,500 and $5,000 per dose of PCC. So if you do have some, you check that INR at the second, you know, that four-hour point, and it's up again, you gotta give, you, now you're in the five to $10,000 range you know, as far as multiple doses. You've got an elderly woman in the nursing home with a big head bleed. You're going to be doing this every four hours? And so you're going to check it every four hours. So if you have that person who has a big, the, the, it's the bad bleed, and you really want them down to normal as, much as, as long as you can until, until they reverse it on their own, okay, because you're withholding. It could very well be. It could very well be. Um, and it really depends where they are in their dosing. You know, if they just took their dose and they're now on their, you know, their effect is on its way up, you may have to give multiple doses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's where the guideline has changed. So your question is, what do you do? Say, let's, give, let's make it an INR of nine. Patient is totally good to be home, not bleeding. Okay, and, but, but INR of nine is too high. They can't sit there. The old recommendation used to be to give IV vitamin K. The problem is that overshoots, gets them down to an INR of 1.2. You know, it overshoots significantly. So what you do with those people is you give them an, or you have them hold their, their warfarin, usually for one or two days, give them oral vitamin K, two and a half to five. Are on the higher side of their INR super high, you know, up in the sort of in the nine and a half range of that range, not the five of that range. Um, so give them the sort of five oral, and then recheck them again tomorrow, their INR tomorrow, and see where they are. Because at some point they're going to have to get back started on that warfarin. But your goal and make sure they're safe at home; they're not going to fall, all that jazz. But what you can do is oral. So IV is now really just restricted to they are bleeding and it's serious business. So you knew you knew he was so you had a head trauma kid who had you knew he was a factor deficient yeah, guy yeah, was he yeah, laden? So five laden. Yeah, and he had four, so right. So I will tell you on those cases where it gets into those weird like oh my word I get on the phone with with him. It's like guide me here. I know FFP has some. Is it enough? How much do I need to give? It's not in that. So it's not in in PCCs. I know it's not in there. So help me with that. And it depends on what what's missing. Um, so, but that, uh, that case I'd get on the phone with a hematologist because you're really getting into tough territory. Yeah. yeah. In the patient that's anticoagulated, not necessarily super therapeutic, but that needs to go to theater for some other reason, not actively bleeding, but needs to be reversed quickly. Mm -hmm. I've seen my anesthetic colleagues not only give vitamin K along with uh, core factor uh, prothrombinex, but also add five to six units of FFP on top of that. Okay. Is that no. So, you're, so the question, so let me, let me um, it's kind of a little, let me te tease it apart. So you have somebody who's elevated INR just because it ne needs to be there, but they need to have an operation done urgently. So that gets reversed for the operation. And just one thing to know about this, they've done research looking at this. If they reverse somebody for an operation and then re they don't, even the valve doesn't clot off. We get kind of worried about the valves. They don't clot as much as we think they do. But that being said, they'll give them um, vitamin K, which is only gonna work tomorrow. So honestly, if they need to go to the operating room today, that's not helpful today. Um, they give them the, f the four factor is a great idea. The adding FFP to four factor probably doesn't add anything. However, if you have three factor, one of the things you need to, so when you go home and you find out what you have, if you have three factor PCCs, what's recommended to reverse is to add two units of FFP per dose of three factor PCC, because what it does is adds factor seven. Adding extra FFP, to my knowledge, doesn't do anything I've read, and I've read about quite a bit about this. I don't, I've never seen anything that says it adds anything to the PCCs. The PCCs have exactly what you want. <laughs>